Rome wasn't built in a day. We could also say enlightenment isn't built in a day, but is built as a result of a day-to-day -day effort. In other words, the only thing that'll get us anywhere on the spiritual path, whether it's concentration, loving kindness, or wisdom that we want to develop, is dedicating ourselves to a daily practice. We take for granted that Olympic athletes and professional musicians train daily to, to achieve mastery of their sport or music. Why wouldn't the same discipline apply to cultivating the most important qualities of our mind? If we want to develop patience, honesty, morality, and wisdom, we have to make a sustained effort. In this show, we'll learn methods to develop our daily practice on and off the cushion through every part of our lives. So what does a daily practice mean? What does it mean to practice? If, as the Buddha said, it's true that we have been cycling in samsara, cyclic existence, for infinite number of lifetimes, what we have been practicing, as evidenced by the fact that we are still here in samsara, has been non-virtue and self-cherishing. What we need to do to remedy this situation is to develop a new habit by practicing virtue and cherishing others. So before listening to these teachings, establish in your mind a very strong motivation to be able not only to understand what it means to have a daily practice, but to establish one in your life, a workable daily practice, as quickly as possible, so that you may be able to benefit all living beings as quickly as possible. So how do I carry out my practice in this life? How do I summarize all the practices, all the practices of the path to enlightenment in, in my life? So this is the first. You have five forces to apply. This is the first, the power, the force of resolution. Set a strong intentions, a strong resolution in the morning. Okay, so this, uh, you have to apply this right in the morning, as soon as you open your eyes, as soon as you wake up, you open your eyes before doing anything else. You just uh, hook up with your mind and set your resolution. So right now, also this morning, I'm alive. I have all the, oh, I have all the favorable circumstances in my life, all the freedoms and endowment in order to progress and practice the path to enlightenment and to benefit all sentient beings. Therefore, as much as I can, as much as I live throughout the day, I'm not going to let my mind under the power of delusions, and I'm not going to harm any sentient beings, and I'm going to be as helpful as possible to uh, all sentient beings. So now, the next is the, uh, the force of the white seed. The force of the white seed is uh, uh, the aim of achieving the supreme enlightenment in order to benefit all mother sentient beings and oneself, for oneself and other purposes, engaging as much as possible throughout the day in practice to purify the previously accumulated negative uh, potentials or karma and accumulating uh, virtuous actions or merits, what we call merits. Mm -hmm. So these are called the white seed. Mm -hmm. So what is the best way then to uh, quickly accumulate merits without making uh, so much effort? Rejoice. 
and uh, rejoicing is an incredible beneficial practice. It allows you to accumulate such a huge ma a mass of merits just with the, with the force of your thought, without engaging in any physical or strenuous uh, difficult uh, practices or activities, just rejoicing of the virtues accumulated by others, by oneself and others, it becomes extremely powerful to swiftly uh, complete the accumulation of merits without so much struggle. You rejoice of the, your virtues, you rejoice of other people's virtues, you rejoice of the virtues of the bodhisattvas, of the buddhas, of the gurus. Of The more you think into, in detail and vast you are, the, vast, the vaster and bigger is that by way of rejoicing you, the merits keep accumulating and accumulating. This is a very good practice. If you undertake whatever, even the smallest positive action you do, it acts as purifier for those previ previously accumulated negative karma. More specific, there are lots of very powerful practices and techniques, such as doing prostrations, taking refuge, reciting uh, what is called the uh, uh, tungsha. Uh, the general confession practice, uh, the uh, practice uh, related to the 35 Buddhas, uh, Vajrasattva meditation and, res and recitation, even just the mantra and so on and so forth. And the third is the force of familiarity. It means that uh, you constantly, you constantly have to take to your mind the practices of the path to enlightenment, especially the steps uh, to generate bodhicitta, and as well as purifying and accumulating merits until it becomes spontaneous for you. You don't need any, it's not a contrived, a contrived thought. You have to bring it to your mind constantly so it becomes so, you become so familiar, so familiar with that particular kind of attitude and behavior that <coughs> you constantly are reminded of the path to enlightenment. So this is the power, the force of familiarity. So the fourth is the uh, force or the power of rejection. And this in general, it refers to all types of delusions. So all, always keep a constant awareness of delusions and their disadvantages for you in order to eliminate it. But particularly be mindful of self-cherishing thought of egoism and do not let uh, the power of, re of rejection is do not let uh, yourself being taken under the power of self-cherishing thought from now on as much as you can. So this is the power of rejection. Uh, so now the force of prayer or dedication. So at the time just before going to sleep, uh, then you apply the last force. All right, you review your day on the basis of your first determination in the morning. So what happened today? How did, how, uh, did I uh, accumulate and which is action? Well, was I uh, been taken under the power of delusions? Did I accumulate virtuous actions? Did, uh, was I able to apply the antidotes and to overcome and to uh, overcome self-cherishing thought and so on and so forth? So you have to analyze very sincerely, focus on whatever negativities I have accumulated today. I've done it for this and this and this. So therefore, I'm going to purify it right now, right now, and uh, tomorrow, I will, be, I will be more mindful, you, you, you make a strong determination again tomorrow, I'm not going to repeat the same mistake. And <coughs> whatever virtues you have accumulated, you, re you review it and you rejoice. So that was very good, I've done it very nicely, I was, able to, I was able to face my mind, I was able to decrease delusions, I was able to do this and this and virtuous action, this is fantastic, tomorrow I'll do even better. So before going to bed, you do this review. This was a very short uh, uh, explanation on how to carry out the practices, how to summarize the practice in, in, in one's life on the basis of, of a daily practice from morning up to night. So this is, uh, this is for what we call daily practices.
one other thing that's very important in, in daily practice is uh, purification. Because even if we do have the intention to be helpful to others and not do things that are harmful or negative, create bad karma and so on, we are just human beings. We have our, our faults, our imperfections, and our limitations, and so we're bound to make mistakes and lose our temper, get angry, or get caught up in negative thoughts and speak in negative ways or do things negative. So, um, so there's something we can do about that when we do make mistakes and create bad karma, and that is purification. So purification is a practice we can do to clear up any negative karma that we've created in, in our day. So it's actually a good thing to do every day because most probably we do create negative karma each day. But we can also purify things we've done before. The, uh, the general practice of purification involves four things, four points, which are called four powers, four opponent powers. Um, first is regret. And regret is not the same as guilt. So there's a difference between regret and guilt. I think we all know guilt. We're all familiar with guilt. That's very common in our culture. And uh, I think of guilt as being more emotional, like we feel really awful about th something that we've done, and maybe we get into beating ourselves up um, and, and thinking, I'm a horrible person. Now, regret, on the other hand, is not so emotional. It's more rational, more reasonable. Regret comes from understanding karma, understanding and believing in karma, accepting karma. So you understand that karma works. We do actions, and those actions leave imprints on our mind, which stay in the mind until some point in the future when the com causes and conditions come together, the imprints ripen and we have some kind of experience as a result of that. So they say regret is similar to the way we would feel if we unknowingly swallowed something that was poisonous. So that's the feeling of regret. That's the first power. The second power is refuge. A refuge is, a, is a, an attitude, a state of mind that comes about by learning what the Buddha taught and feeling confidence, feeling trust in the Buddha and his teachings, um, agreeing with them and wanting to follow them. Um, so that's just in general what it means to take refuge, very simply speaking. Um, so if you're a Buddhist, then the second power would involve renewing your, uh, your, your refuge or sense of commitment to the Buddha and his teachings. But if you're not a Buddhist, then um, you may have other objects of faith that you have faith or trust or confidence in and that you take as your guides and wish to follow. So, um, so you could just renew your, your uh, determination to follow those objects of your faith. And it can also involve generating or renewing your wish to benefit others, your feelings of compassion and love and kindness towards others and the wish to not harm them and the wish to help them. Then the third of the four powers is what I call remedy. Uh, and this involves doing something positive or virtuous to counteract the negative thing you've done by creating this bad karma. So you can do traditional virtuous things like saying prayers or reciting mantras or meditation on loving-kindness or meditation on other aspects of the path. Um, but you could also be creative and find your own ways of doing something virtuous that is a countermeasure to the negative thing you've done. Like, for example, if you did something that was like stealing or cheating, then you could give money. You could give a donation to charity or to some good cause. So generally we need to do something positive, something virtuous to oppose or counteract the negative thing we've done. Then the fourth power is the power of resolution or determination. And that involves um, 
generating in your mind some kind of determination about refraining from doing the same thing again in the future. So this is really, really important because if we do something negative and then we say, oh, I'm sorry, and we do some purification, but then we go back and do it again and again and again, then it's not so wise or helpful. So there needs to be at least the wish to, uh, even if we can't get to the point where we'll never do it again, but at least to lessen the amount of time we do it, the, you know, to decrease the incidence of doing that same action again. So they say, you can, uh, if, if it is something that you feel, I will never do it again, and you can make that kind of promise and keep it, then okay. But if it's something that you have been doing habitually and you wouldn't be able to just stop it altogether, then you could make a promise to not do it for a limited period of time, like the next five minutes, or the next hour, or the, you know, half a day. So, so find something that's reasonable, that's within your abilities, and try to just be aware and mindful for that period of time and try to refrain from doing that action again. So there are particular practices in the Tibetan tradition for purification that are all sort of written up and set up that include these four powers. One of the more famous, popular ones is the practice of Vajrasattva. It's a particular Buddha figure that we visualize, and then we generate these, these powers, regret, thinking about the things we've done, we feel regret for, generating refuge and the wish to benefit other beings. Then, um, for the power of the remedy, we recite a mantra. There's a mantra associated with Vajrasattva. There's a long one that's got 100 syllables. And there's also a short one that is very simple, Om Vajrasattva Hum. And so you recite that mantra, and that's particularly good to purify, to clear out negative karma that's been created. Then at the end of the practice, you generate a resolution to refrain from doing the action again. Another one is the 35 Buddhas, which there's a tanka here uh, showing the 35 Buddhas. So that practice involves, again, first thinking about the things you want to purify, generating regret for them, and then taking refuge in the 35 Buddhas, and then reciting their names. So reciting the names of these 35 Buddhas, and if you can, doing prostrations to them at the same time, bowing to them, that is for the third power, the power of the remedy. So that's a very virtuous thing, to recite names of Buddhas and also prostrate to them. And then you go through a prayer of confession of the negative things you've done, and then at the end, generate a resolution to not do it again. And like I say, it's good if we can, if we can do a purification practice every night, because probably during the day we have done things that were negative, and if we don't purify, then um, another thing that happens with karma is that it, it multiplies. So uh, if you do something negative one day, and then you don't do anything to purify it, by the second day it's multiplied, it's become worse, heavier. And that happens each day that we don't purify. So the sooner we can purify, the better. So that's why it's a good idea to do it at night to um, purify any negative karma we've done during that day so that at least we stop it from multiplying until the next day. I think the first thing that I started to do in terms of a daily practice was actually starting... I used to do some meditation before I was a Buddhist but it was more like set my motivation as, as taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha for the sake of all sentient beings. So then that would be the main thing. I think that was for a f good few months. Then um, I was interested in um, prostrations. I got very drawn to doing that. And um, then the, the whole thing with purification, um, which I didn't really know about, but as I did prostrations, I learned more. So I did the 35 Buddha practice. Every day I would do at least 35. I used to do like a hundred every day. Sometimes it would, because of when I started to work full time, night duty and things like that, it, it would be difficult. So I'd just do the basic commitment. Um, but then obviously when I was in retreat, 
I don't know how, but I managed to do like, like maybe a thousand or so a day. Or I think maybe at one point I got up to two thousand. But it, you know, I don't know how what the quality was. But you know, it was really different. When I did intensive, you could see the the lamb rim, you know, impermanence, fresh as human rebirth, and um, in renunciation. You could feel that these these are things I really need to, to realise. I mean, just, I got to feel a little bit of the quality of, of the Lam Rim. I went back to England and I trained as a nurse. I realised that my practice was out there with people, caring for them. They were, they're the priority. If I have spent time doing my practice in the morning, then I go to work. My heart is really so much more open. And I'm focused on them. Otherwise, you know, I can be a little bit more interested in me. I must go and get my breakfast or whatever. Um, but I also think that the, the work helps to open my heart as well. I, actually, it works both ways. So my practice helps my work, but my, wor my work helps my practice. I see so much suffering in that job. It, it's, it's hard work, but yet because I have the Dharma, there's a bigger perspective, and I, and, and I can do prayers for people. So when I come home, which is really important, I feel like it's my duty, you know, as, as a Buddhist, you know, for, for, for me as trying to develop bodhicitta. So I pray for all my patients that they will become enlightened soon. So at the end of the day, I do Vajrasattva, um, to purify everything. So I try to think about everything I've done in the day that's negative karma, but also try to expand that, that that's not just today, that's many times this life, many times in many lives. So I try to really expand that and then um, do the Vajrasattva meditation, a, a recitation and um, try to make a promise to not do those things for as, as much time as I feel I can. And then um, I dedicate, and I try to do a dedication that ex it includes um, all the people that I care for in in the hospital, family, friends, and I try to also to expand it to as many people I can think of because I think it's something very important about focusing on individuals in the dedication. Um, but obviously, I use the dedication um, for all beings. I'd love to do my practice, I really do. And I feel so sad when I can't spend so much time on it. It makes me feel really sad. And I've noticed when, when I've had lots going on in my life and I haven't been able to do my practice, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy, I'm not a happy person. And um, I also, don't like doing my practice as much, which is quite interesting. And when I have time and I do my practice, I'm a happier person.